that were here for this morning's lecture, he gave me a couple options, and I knew without a doubt the one that I wanted to speak about. He said, well, there's one about marriage. I said, I would love to do that. He said, good, we're looking for someone young to bring a different perspective. And while he did say I lack a little experience when it comes to marriage, we've been married. This is actually our anniversary today, three years and eight months. We accept gifts, cards, checks, money. <laughs> get us before we leave. So we've been married three years and eight months, which is actually 1,339 days. If that's not enough experience for you, we can make the number a little bit bigger. 115,689,600 seconds. Is that good enough for you? But the blessing about what we're about to talk about this morning does not come from my experience, but it comes from the words of God which, if I'm not mistaken, is much older than any of us here this morning. If you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. And what I would like to do this, uh, this morning is I want to go through the text of 1 Peter. And when I got the directions, if you will, for what we were going to be talking about, he said you can pull from Old Testament or New Testament, but the verse that we want you to cover is from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Let me read that to you quickly, and then I'll tell you what we'll be doing this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 goes like this. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers not be hindered. As I thought about the topic at hand, and I look at that verse, I asked this question. Why was Peter writing about marriage right then? And so what I want to do this morning, and Lord willing, in the time that we have, we'll be able to accomplish it. We're going to start in chapter 1 uh, for this first part, the overview of the text, and we're going to work through chapter 5. Now what we know about 1 Peter is that this is written in a time of severe persecution. These Christians are struggling with their faith. If you look at chapter 5, we know the passage well, and the, uh, the Satan walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You ever think about the power of that verse there at the end of the book? He says, in this time of persecution, Satan's looking to see how he can get your soul. And in talking about getting your soul, he lists three things from chapter 2 to chapter 3. He talks about submission to the government, submission to your masters, and then he talks about marriage. Yeah, my experience is lacking in that sense. One of the sisters said to me earlier, she said, you look like you're 13. <laughs> I had a brother tell me just a few weeks ago, I'm 25 years old, I'll be 26 in October, he said, brother, I got socks that are older than me. <laughs> but none of that ultimately matters when we look at this passage. When we go back and we examine what God has to say, brethren, I want you to open your minds and your hearts and don't listen to me, but look at what God has to say to you this morning. Because, and also, I don't want you to do this. Sometimes when there's a topic that might not apply to you, we do the, well, I got to, I came to the lectureship, and that has to count. So I'm going to fall asleep, and I'm gonna, that's going to be the end of my, he's preaching about marriage. I've been married a long time. What can he tell me that I don't already know? Or if you're here right now, and you're not married, and you say, well, yeah, like the brother mentioned, well, this, it, that's, a, that's an old philosophy. We're going to look at what God's word has to say from 1 Peter. So open your Bibles with me. We're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1. And what I want to do from these first two chapters, at least the first part of the first two, is I want you to see three things. Number one, that your Father in heaven cares about you greatly. Number two, that Christ is your foundation. It is what we build ourselves up on as Christians. And number three is that we need to rely on our family. Now, as we work through this passage, keep those three thoughts in mind. Now, also pause again. We're working through the lens, if you will, from Joshua 24, 15. I was super excited for the theme because I don't have a hobby horse back home, but I strongly believe that we have neglected the power of our choices. We have neglected the power of our own personal accountability and responsibility when it comes to our Father in Heaven. Well, I was just raised that way. Some might say, that doesn't matter. God's still God, and we still have to be obedient to him. Well, this happened when I was younger, and I can't change it. You're right, you can't change it then. 
You can't change where you were born, how you were born, to whom you were born, but we can change who we serve Amen. each and every day that we live the life of this on this earth. Choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve. This morning we're talking about marriage. So look to the passage, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. These Christians had been dispersed. These Christians have been persecuted. They've been murdered. They've been chased out of their homes. This book is written to Christians, for Christians, about Christians, to help Christians grow. To help Christians to remain focused in a time when the world around them was crumbling. Have you ever felt like that? Sometimes even, if, you know, we look at society today, we look on the news and we hear this. Everything's falling around us. The division that's in the country, all these things that are happening. And you say, God, this world's falling apart. He writes to the pilgrims of the dispersion, but keep reading it. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. But notice what God the Father gives you. Chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten, notice the word I have underlined in my Bible, us, again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice this inheritance that only Christians have from the Father through Jesus Christ, the foundation. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away. And not only does it not fade away, it is reserved in heaven for you by what? The power of God. Your Father in heaven has a spot reserved for you. Now notice what it's not saying. That your place is always guaranteed there. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, you better be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. But God says, when you're faithful, I got this spot with your name on it. Yeah, Christians, the world's falling down around you, and the world's giving up hope, if you want to say that. But I got a spot for you. To us as Christians, to those that have been dispersed, your Father in heaven is the key component. Keep reading. We're not going to be able to read this all. Or I'll have to take the brother's time and the brother's time after that. But in chapter 1, he talks about this heavenly hope that we have. This uncorruptible place reserved by God. But notice what he says in verse 9. The purpose behind that, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what I know about God? He desires all men to be saved. That all should come to repentance, right? And that in that he writes you in this hope, this thing that we can count on, this spot that's been reserved for you, he says, I want your soul. Your Father in heaven wants your soul. If you keep going in the passage, he's going to be talking about the living before God. Notice uh, verse uh, 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. We as Christians strive to live like you, our Father in heaven. Amen? Amen? Our Father in heaven is holy. That's why I need to be holy. This relationship that I have with God is He's my Father. Now go down to chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Coming to Him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. You know what that tells me about my family in Christ? Is that we're being built up together and I can count on you and you can count on me. Because our Father is God, our foundation is Jesus Christ. And brethren, we're building this house together, aren't we? Amen. Keep reading the passage. Offer up in spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, that is you and that's me. He is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Just a few more verses here. Go down a little bit. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, these Christians that have been dispersed, these Christians that were persecuted and dying for their faith, their worlds have been falling apart, but you, he says, are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. My God, 
my Father in heaven, my Jesus Christ, the foundation to our faith. We are being built up in him, a family that can count on one another, a holy nation meant to be different from the world. Now, pause with me just for a moment. I hope you're not thinking it yet, but what in the world does that have to do with marriage? And I tell you this morning, it's got everything to do with marriage. Amen. Who your father is, what your foundation's built on, and who your family is. But we'll get to that just in a moment. Keep reading with me. Your own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness. That's where you were. Where are you now? Into his marvelous light. You were once not a people, but are now the people of God. You didn't used to belong here, but now you do. You used to walk in darkness, but you don't anymore. I'm preaching through the prison epistles on Sunday night. And what's incredible, both in Ephesians chapter um, five, well, in the book of Ephesians and in the book of Colossians, he talks about you put to death those old members. You used to be a part of something, this world, but you're not a part of that anymore. You're different to rise, to walk in newness of life. Seek and say, Colossians chapter 3, you're different now. Your father is in heaven. Your foundation is on Christ. And the church is your family. Who have not, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now pause with me for that. In this first part of the chapter, from chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 10, the fundamental keys that we see there, I've told you three separate times, but I'm going to tell you once more, that your Father in heaven has given you this heavenly hope that's uncorruptible and undefiled, reserved in heaven for you if you're found to be faithful. Through Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the foundation of your faith that you have been built upon as a spiritual house. And in all of that, your Christian brethren are suffering. He's going to go on and talk about that in chapter 4. And there's suffering and there's pain and there's agony in this world. But he says, we're together in this. Love God. Love your brethren. Be standing firm on Jesus Christ. Now again, as we move into the next part of this text, chapter 2, verse 11 and following. Notice what it says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works do what? Which they observe glorify God. And then he's going to give three examples of the things that we um, should submit to. The first part, submit to your government. Sometimes we struggle with that, don't we? We see signs, and it's like we have to rebel against the sign just because it tells us something we ought not do. Verse 13, Therefore submit to yourselves every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors. But go down to verse 17. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God. Honor the king. There's a relationship that we have when it comes to the life that we're living to the government that is at hand. You ever see Paul complaining about Rome? He says, can you believe Rome did this? He says, preach the word of God. He says, can you believe Rome did that? He says, live like Jesus. Submit yourselves to government. The second, the second thing he mentions is submit yourself to the masters, verse 18. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. Verse 19, for this is commendable if because of conscience toward God. Notice how everything that Peter writes about refers back to God. Your Father in heaven. Your conscience toward God. Fear God. You see how it all points back to who your Father is. Where your heart belongs, like our brother said earlier. Because you cannot serve two masters, but it wasn't him that said it, right? It came from Jesus, our Lord and Savior. You cannot serve two masters. Then he comes to marriage. Chapter 3. Wives, let wives be submissive to your own husbands. I like that part. <laughs> I haven't been married long, but I like that part. <laughs> that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. I have been incredibly blessed. I have been married only three years and eight months, you're right, but every moment of those days has been a blessing to me. Do you know why? 
Because I'm married in the Lord. Amen. Because when I get up in the morning, I know I can count on my wife. I know that she has a father in heaven. And her foundation is built on Christ. And her family is the body of Christ. That's you and me. I have been blessed to know that my wife is a Christian. I don't know if you know this, but preaching's hard. <laughs> Man, preaching is tough. And sometimes I come home a little dejected, say, sweet wife, why don't the church listen? They just don't listen to the words of God anymore. Just maybe it's not you. <laughs> it's their minds in their heart. You just keep preaching. You did such a great job. Yes. If I didn't do a good job, she'll also tell me that in the Lord, right? <laughs> and that wasn't your best. They probably didn't get it because nobody got it. You didn't know it yourself. <laughs> but without her, my battle would be so much harder. The work would be so much more difficult. But I know I can count on her. And I can lean on her. See, the observation, the overview from the text is that you have a Father in heaven who loves you and wants your soul to be saved. And you and I, he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And that in that he says, your marriage is important. Wives, submit to your husbands. Keep reading. Go down to verse 7, our passage for this morning that we haven't spent a lot of time on, but I see what you think you see what we're getting at. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. Giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. He talks about government. He talks about uh, the masters that you work with and you work for. And then he talks about marriage. And he mentions there that your prayers be not hindered, that your work be not hindered in the Lord. My wife is a blessing to me in preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. But not just the preaching part. The living part. See, preaching only happens certain times during each week. This is a Monday. Technically, this is my day off. <laughs> preaching only happens, at least vocally this way, very little. But my Christianity is all day, every day. And she helps me with that. She helps me to make sure that I'm choosing for myself this day whom I will serve, whom my house will serve, because we're in that together, the joint heirs to the grace of life. There's a few more things from the text that we'll get to our practical observations. Go over with me just a little bit to chapter 4, and again, we're going to move through this pretty quickly. But notice what he says in verse 15. This is a passage that we know. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense. Whoever asks you for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good works, notice what it says there, two words, in Christ, may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God, the Father that you serve, that God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He's going to go on in chapter 4 to talk about Christ's suffering and how we can relate to it. And he's going to talk about your brethren suffering. Notice chapter 5. Notice, go over to verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. We know that passage, right? But keep reading. Resist him. Stand fast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Your father's in heaven. Christ is your foundation. And your brethren are your spiritual house. And those same brethren are going through difficult trials just like you. Now, that was a very brief, rapid overview of the text from the book of 1 Peter. But I want you to know that the reason we spent time doing that is Peter, in this time of severe persecution, he takes the Christians back to some key fundamentals in which they need to make sure that they're choosing. Joshua 24, 15. He says, choose for yourselves this day. Peter says, remember your Father in heaven. Remember the life that we're supposed to be living, the decisions that we're supposed to be making, and remember that your foundation is built on Christ. And your family, your Christian family, is in you in this battle with you. 
in this war, waging this spiritual warfare with you. You're going to suffer, it's going to be hard, but remember that. And don't forget it. So for the time we have left, with that mindset of opening up the text and just looking at what the Bible says, and the power that I think of Peter reflecting on marriage, let's look at some practical observations. Number one, I don't know if you know this, but you take after your father. My wife, when we got married, now my in-laws are here, so I'll watch what I say. But they, they are a blessing to me just as she is. And I remember when we got, when we, well, we're only recently married still anyway, but new into our marriage, we were going somewhere, and she said to me, well, we have to unplug everything. I said, what? We have to unplug everything. If you start a fire, you leave, you're not here, you don't know if the house is catch on fire. We unplug everything. I said, what in the world? <laughs> but come to find out at my in-law's house, when they go away for a little while, they unplug everything. Don't need to start a fire. I said, okay. She takes after her father. <laughs> Something else that stood out to me, or new into our marriage, the first time we went on vacation, she said to me, hey, did you check the oil in the car and the tire pressure? And I said, what? <laughs> no, I didn't check the oil in the car and the tire pressure. Why are you asking me about this? Well, my dad always does it. So, she ain't wrong. <laughs> but you take after your father in heaven. Now notice some passages with me. Turn with me to John chapter 8. Now this is about to get serious. Notice the words of God. John chapter 8 verse 42. Now when it comes to marriage, I know my wife takes after her father and her mother, which most times, besides those crazy moments when she's making me do extra things, is a blessing. But notice what Jesus writes in John chapter 8, starting in verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. See, marriage is important. You all know that, right? Marriage is important. And when you come together and you take after your father and I take after my father, now Bettina's father and my father physically are much different. I was in and out of foster care. The only thing that I've learned from my biological father, and I did quick to displace it, and my family is quick to temper. Some of you might have struggled with that as well. It's quick to speak, slow to listen. My biological father, my parent, biological parents were into drugs and alcohol. I was in and out of the foster care system three times. So my half-brother took me and my sister in. Her father and my biological father are absolutely from different ends of the spectrum. But you know what I noticed? She takes after her father, and there's some things I take after as well. But you know what changes that? When my father's in heaven, so is hers. Amen. 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 Yeah, I take after my father. Let me tell you what my father has to say about this. See, it's no longer about my biological father as a Christian, is it? Remember what Jesus said? Well, your mother and your brothers are here. He said, who's my mother and my brothers? Those who do the will of the Father in heaven. Those who do the will of God. See, our father is the same, and we need to strive in our marriage to take after our father. That's something you can count on when you marry a Christian. Amen. Not only do you take after your father, and there's a couple more passages. Is there supposed to be a clock there? <laughs> you let me know. Okay, I'm just going to keep preaching until I know. <laughs> Looks like a clock should be there, but it's not. Someone cover it up. <laughs> Turn, you know the passage in John chapter 14. In my father's house are many mansions. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what? That I might take you to be there with me. See, not only is our Father the same, but the place we're working towards is the same as well. And it's a place prepared by Jesus Christ. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John, chapter 3. This is where we'll end with this first point. 1 John, chapter 3. Notice verse 1 and verse 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Now pause with me just for a moment. 
If the world doesn't know God, but yet we want to come into a covenant relationship with those in the world, where does that put us? Amen. Your father's not my father. My father's not your father. See, I belong to my father in heaven. I'm a child of God. But when I come into that covenant with someone outside of that covenant with God, their father's not the same. And you know what I can count on? They can take after their father as well. See, I'm a common sense kind of guy. I'm not deep philosophical or theological, but just read what the text says. Put it in your life, put it in your heart, and act upon it. If I'm stepping on your toes, as I heard a brother say, I'm sorry, I'm aiming for your heart. I want your walk in Christ to be the best that it can be, to join heirs to the grace of life, Peter writes. And if I know that I can count on my spouse to have the same father, what a blessing it is. Amen. What a blessing it is to be able to count on that part in my marriage for the rest of my life. Yes, Practical observation number two is not only do we have the same father, and do not only do you take after your father, but you can rely on your foundation. How you were raised is something when things get hard, you will go back to, of that I am certain. My initial reaction when I get frustrated is to spout off at the mouth. I mean, I do preach for a living, church. And I, when this person said that, well, let me tell what I think. Let me tell you, no. Rely on your foundation. Now, if your foundation is of the world, you know, Jesus talks about, I feel like he talks about it in Matthew chapter 7. There's two men. The one man built his house upon the rock, and when the floods came, and the winds came, and the rain was there, it stood strong. Why? Because it was built on the rock, his foundation. But that other man built his house on the sand. His foundation is different. And you can count on someone to go back to their foundation. Well, I was just raised this way. My father's in heaven and my foundation is Jesus Christ. I'm raised this way as well. We think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For no foundation can anyone else lay than what? That which is Jesus Christ. You can rely on your foundation. Now, if you've got two separate foundations, where does that put you? Right now, if you marry outside the Lord, you got two separate fathers. You got two separate foundations, and then last, you got two separate families. Now you can count on your family, can't you? Some of you, maybe, possibly. <laughs> when things get hard, okay, you can count on your family. Now what if your family's of the world with the father that you serve and the foundation that you live? You see, the more and more as we talk about this point just from 1 Peter, you're getting farther and farther away from this person that you want to share your life with. Farther and farther away. You've got a different father, a different foundation, and a different family. And here talks about your brethren that are suffering. This brethren, us, we have this grace. Us, we have this mercy. Us, we have this hope of heaven. The world does not have that. I started thinking about some of the things I heard. But we have so much in common. That's not a good thing. Maybe your father isn't exactly the father that you claim. Maybe your foundation isn't exactly built on the rock that cannot be moved. Maybe your family isn't built up as a spiritual home, a spiritual nation. Well, I just love him so. I get that. I was young once. <laughs> I remember Brother Brian and the people at the school preacher will be able to know this, Miss Betty. And I was dating my soon-to-be wife. I didn't know it at the time. I had a picture of her up on the wall. Sat back in the corner there. I was young and in love. But what I knew is that we had the same father. And I knew that one day if I could catch her, if I could just keep following her, I followed her up the free, dead up to my eyeballs, I followed her anyway. I said, I know what I can have with this blessing of a wife. I know her father, I know her foundation, I know her family. And when things get hard, because in marriage things get hard, there's been problems in our marriage. My wife struggled with ulcerative colitis. You might know what that is, you might not, that's okay, we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> but she struggles with an autoimmune disease. She's been in the hospital twice, not since we've been married, thankfully. I like to think I'm a good medicine. Uh, but she was in the hospital before we married two times, two weeks each time. 
And you know what you recognize when some when I would drive, you can attest to this, I drive from school over to the hospital. Come back to school, go back to the hospital. I was there, wasn't I, Donna? <laughs> Make sure you tell everybody I was there. You say, yeah. <laughs> I was there. But not only just because I was in love with her, because I knew she needed me. Amen. And in marriage, you know, you need to know that you need that person to count on that person. When times get hard, and they will, you can rely on them. But if your foundation is different, and your family's different, and your father's not my father, how much can I truly rely on you? Amen. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve two foundations. You cannot serve two families. When we think about these practical observations and we think about just some of the things from the text, I want you to understand what this, and we'll spend the rest of our time doing this. If you've been married, if you're a Christian who's married to a Christian, this lesson is for you as well. Because what I see in the text and what I see in the Bible in Joshua 24, 15 is you still have to choose to love your spouse in the ways that they need. Amen, husbands? You know what it says in there? Husbands love your wives. You hear wives say, well, he just doesn't love me like I need. Husbands love your wives. But it's weird to, to do those things. She wants me to get dressed up and I wear a tie on Sundays. She wants me to take her out and buy flowers. They're going to die anyway. She wants to go on a vacation in the woods. I don't want to go in the woods. I don't like the woods. Husbands love your wives. Choose to love them. And it's just as important. Listen to me now. For our, you say, you know, brother said, easy. we want a younger perspective. I'm looking to you to marry much longer than me. I need to see your marriage in God, your father, your foundation, and your family. I need to see you choosing to love your spouse, wives submitting, husbands loving. But you know why young people struggle with this choice? Because they ain't seeing it. Amen. They ain't seen it at home, Amen. and they ain't seen it in church, and that hurts. You say, well, why did they pick that spouse? Because they never saw anything different. Let them see Jesus in you. I love, I love looking at those couples that have been married 90 years. He still goes and opens her door. Slowly, but he still goes and opens her door. <laughs> I had a brother tell me just on Sunday his wife died. Brother George told us he used to be an elder down at Lemon Bay. And he said, uh oh. <laughs> the, brother, the brother said, he said, you know what I want you to do? Every time you go home, I don't care how long you've been away from your spouse, every time you go home, I want you to go to her, I want you to kiss her on the forehead, and I want you to hug her and tell her you love her. Husbands, you need to love your wife. Wives, you need to love your husbands. And you need to show these young people what marriage is about. Amen. You need to show them that when times are hard, I can count on my father, my foundation, and my family in God. Amen. And if you show them that, I can guarantee you they won't be looking outside the realms of Christianity. The last thing before I close, and this goes to every person in this auditorium, do not settle for less. You know what people told me before I got married? Well, I, I talk about how much I love my wife and how much, uh, how much I'm going to love my wife and all these things. They said, well, just wait till you've been married 10 years. So what does that got to do with my love for my wife? We settle for less in our marriage, don't we? And then our young people are like, well, I guess that's good enough. Now, when I say, man, we need to be looking to godly people. Not just someone who comes to church. Amen. That is not a Christian. Amen. You're sitting in the garage, are you a car? I didn't think so. <laughs> you marry someone who you can see God in them. Amen. You can see their father because they're going to take after them. And don't settle for less. Amen. Ladies, your wives need to love you and don't let them forget it. Husbands, your wives need to love you. Don't let them forget it in the Lord. Amen. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for Marriage is a blessing from God, an institution instilled in Genesis. Amen. In the beginning, it was not so. Husbands love your wives. Wives love your husbands. And show the church the blessings of marriage. Thank you for your time.